Hey, Logan. Hi. Good morning. No, it's not morning. It's night. Oh, also funny. Hey, Cassie. Hi. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, I'm. Yeah, I know. I was just saying you got class, and so do I. <laughs> it's my son. That that fuzzy figure over there. Hey, Robert. Yeah. Do you want to do it right there? Because I've got it happening right here. Okay. You're still like right in view. I mean, you can. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So um, might as well get started here. So we're entering into spectrophotometry territory. And, you know, all you need to remember from this really is A equals epsilon BC and A equals minus log of P over P naught. And, uh, you know, and that absorbance is sum, so epsilon b c's sum, right? But there's a lot of interesting uh, things to know about that, right? And uh, one of the first things that I'd like to talk to you all about is um, uh, the ozone problem in the atmosphere. And uh, it was, this was of a lot of importance to the world in the uh, 80s, the 1980s. And um, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of misinformation around it, you know. But um, basically, it was discovered that there was, um, over, particularly over Antarctica, there was a this growing um, hole in the ozone layer that um, protects the earth. And, uh, uh, and the way that the ozone layer protects the, the earth is that the ozone um, layer, it's like, it's like sunscreen, you know, it absorbs a lot of ultraviolet light that goes through, normally goes through oxygen and, um, you know, nitrogen and, and carbon dioxide and gets to the earth, but the ozone has broadband uh, uh, UV absorption in it, and it's strongly attenuated by um, ozone, and oddly, um, different frequencies of ultraviolet are also responsible for the creation of ozone. So where O2 absorbs to make um, atomic oxygen, uh, uh, that will make um, uh, oxygen atoms, which can react with oxygen molecules to make ozone, this weird um, uh, three atom oxygen or trioxygen uh, molecule, right? And um, so, um, you know, there was a lot of concern that what was going on, what was happening. And it took a, um, some interesting spectroscopic work to, to discover this, right? And uh, the, uh, there was a uh, satellite called the Aura that measures the differential optical absorption of the uh, Earth and the solar, uh, the atmosphere and the solar radiation. So as you can see in this uh, figure, there are two sources of radiation, uh, P0, which is light that strikes a satellite directly from the sun. And then there's a beam that's reflected off the earth, reflected off the atmosphere in part, off the earth's surface in part, and that part is called uh, P, right? And the, this um, 
spectrometer can measure uh, uh, radiation between 270 and 500 nanometers. And, um, and uh, within this region, it, it uh, detected a large increase in the uh, uh, amount of radiation coming back in the 270 range. And, um, uh, and this is particularly uh, uh, pronounced over the Antarctic. And it also has a seasonal component, but it was growing and it was kind of getting worse and people were alarmed. And uh, it, uh, and one of the, uh, so, well, ozone, like uh, other molecules in the atmosphere um, has <clears throat> uh, an interesting absorption profile. So um, the lambda max for ozone is around 260. That's 250, 60, 70, 80, 90, 300, right? Maybe it's closer to 250 or so, but um, this top um, figure shows the um, absorption spectrum of ozone, right? And this is in a molecular, Cross section, and these are these are actually barns. That's a a uh, unit that a nuclear physicist is like, but it's ten to the minus seventeen or ten to the minus nineteen rather is uh, ten to the minus eight centimeters, which is uh, approximately one angstrom. So this is like a, a one angstrom on the side square that's completely black to, to radiation of that frequency. So um, there's, uh, if you collapse all the ozone in the atmosphere to one layer, it's, it's only about a millimeter thick, but it's a, it's a good strong absorber. It has a hundred, so it's um, maybe 10 by 10 angstroms per molecule. And that's enough to dramatically reduce the amount of uh, radiation, I guess, to the earth, right? Uh, other similar molecules in the uh, uh, atmospheric spectrum are uh, chlorine monoxide and um, uh, formaldehyde. And uh, formaldehyde has interest, has a lot of resolvable uh, uh, vibrational electronic structure there, as, as does chlorine monoxide. Ozone has some. And um, so you can determine these three gases independently uh, just by looking at the, at the fine structure of the spectrum and uh, figuring out how much of each of the three gases is in the, is in the um, ozone layer. So um, uh, some of the, uh, 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 scientists at NASA were monitoring the ozone concentration, and then between around 1960 and 19 and uh, the early 90s, the um, ozone concentration uh, decreased by a factor of two thirds, and that was alarming. You know, this fortunately was just over the Antarctic, so it didn't affect many humans. Maybe some sunburned penguins down there, <laughs> so, but. It didn't, it didn't have great environmental consequences that we know of. So, um, and then since then it has, uh, has rebounded uh, slightly, right? And um, it turns out that uh, an atmospheric scientist uh, named Susan Solomon, uh, she figured out the mechanism for this happening. So there's Susan, the picture of Antarctica <laughs> and um, uh, and she found out that the active um, the ozone depleter was atomic chlorine. So, uh, and so there's a lot of chlorine and uh, it turns out that um, uh, the culprit was chlorofluorocarbons. So um, 
uh, the chlorofluorocarbons are um, the most common one is called freon, and it's um, uh, I think it's a well actually I shouldn't speculate. It's a small uh, uh, molecule similar to an alkane, but it contains only carbon uh, fluorine and carbon carbon bonds, and that gets up in the atmosphere and it absorbs ultraviolet light and it uh, breaks apart and releases chlorine atoms, and the chlorine atoms uh, scavenge ozone. And there's a catalytic cycle where the chlorine uh, uh, reduces the amount of chlorine atoms, or uh, chlorine reduces the amount of ozone atoms. And it's a, um, a catalytic process, right? And uh, so um, the amount of uh, chlorine is, still, or the amount of ozone is still down, um, but uh, yeah, interesting story there, right? So, oh, and one of the interesting consequences of this was that um, uh, Freon, which is uh, one of the, the worst uh, chemicals for doing this, it was ubiquitous. It was used in all kinds of um, like hairspray and propellants in uh, uh, aerosol cans, you know, and it was also used in uh, uh, um, it, it's also used in refrigeration to, to it's in the closed loop cycles of refrigerators. So um, uh, so since this time, Freon has been phased out. So that was sort of a major, um, uh, major uh, win for the ecologists of the time for, for humanity as, as a whole, right? So thank you, ecologists. <laughs> so, um, so we're gonna talk first about light and the properties of light. And then we're gonna talk about how to use light to make chemical measurements, okay? So um, one of the first things to understand about light is that it behaves as both a wave and a particle. So um, I, I kind of disagree with the um, uh, notion of wave as a particle, but uh, we can talk about that. And, and it, it works to think about it this way, right? But um, light is most certainly a, a wave in the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Because um, the, um, it was discovered by uh, James Clark Maxwell that the speed of light C is equal to um, one over the square root of epsilon naught uh, mu naught, right? And this is, so this is what, based on electrostatic and um, uh, magnetic measurements, uh, these two constants will work out just based on the ratio of field strength to uh, a voltage and uh, magnetic field strength to a, a electric current, right? Um, Maxwell developed the differential equations that describe light. And he, after he'd done that, he realized that light could, should be able to, or that, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maxwell described the properties of electromagnetism, right? charges and the magnetic forces that they, they create when they move, right? So in the time it was electrons and the magnetic fields that they make. And mu naught and epsilon naught were derived from just uh, experiments using uh, uh, forces between electrically charged plates and uh, voltages and uh, forces derived from magnetic fields, right? And so these two constants, epsilon naught and mu naught, come out of this electrostatics work, right? And when Maxwell made the uh, differential equations to describe the interaction between electrical and magnetic fields, he then realized that electromagnetic fields ought to be able to propagate as a wave. And those waves were um, then, uh, uh, they're, they're, 
speed was calculated and that speed was C and that was only 1% different from the speed of light which had been measured. You know, there was a guy named uh, Fizeau who measured the speed of light using a very clever um, uh, lantern and a spinning wheel of a uh, wheel that was spinning really fast. So, um, uh, so uh, it was very clear that light was an electromagnetic wave at that point, right? And uh, and so the, and and that explains uh, the property of interference of light and uh, explains the diffraction of light and even the reflection of light. And um, uh, so the, the wave theory is incredibly good at describing light. However, um, there is one of the things that we measure about light, when we measure light, it always shows up in packets of energy, right? So let's say we're measuring, um, uh, measuring blue light, right? So let's say uh, lambda is equal to um, uh, 45 nanometers. When we measure that, we get counts on a detector, right? Or we see individual points on a piece of film that get exposed, right? And that's just sort of naturally how this shows up, right? And um, the thing is that each count has an energy E that's equal to uh, Planck's constant times the frequency of the light or um, it's inversely proportional to the wavelength there. So E is equal to HC over lambda, right? We'll, we'll see that again, right? So um, uh, the uh, differential equation that describes light in, in electrical and magnetic terms uh, show that uh, light is a transverse wave, right? So that it, if it's propagating to the right, the, uh, the E field is going up and down, right? It's not like going, like a sound wave is a transverse wave. I'm sorry, it's a longitudinal wave. And it, it, it kind of goes forward kind of like, um, it has compressions and rarefactions. I don't know, it's hard to draw, but, um, but light, there's this transverse os oscillation in light that uh, that pushes it along, right? And the um, and the uh, the magnetic and electric fields are always um, at ninety degrees to one another, and they hit nodes at the same point, and they hit maxima at the same point, right? So um, so you can you can with this and similar uh, pictures of light, you can deduce all kinds of uh, properties of light, such as the way that light interacts with itself and other waves and it diffracts, et cetera, right? Um, and uh, it travels really fast, 10 to the eighth meters per second, which is, it turns out, a real fundamental for the universe, right? That's um, uh, the fastest that, any, any physical object can move through space. Uh, like space is this entity and things move in space sort of electrically, you know? And this is the limit, you know? That nothing can go any faster than this really uh, relative to any other thing in, in space, right? So, um, and that took a lot of, you know, pretty brain twisting uh, work by Einstein to figure out. And that was, and he came up with relativity, which first explained light and then explained gravity, which is just crazy, you know, I, I ex explained the properties of matter approaching the speed of light, right? And it, it made these deductions about the ultimate speed of the universe, right? And then he went on and generalized it and it folded gravity into it. And it was a very spectacular result um, there. But in any case, uh, uh, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So that's um, 300,000 meters per second. 
And so, you know, that's a trip to the moon and back in like less than a second or something like that. Anyways, it's awfully fast, but on a galactic scale, it's very slow, you know? The, the, the galaxy is thousands of light years in dimension, you know? So it takes light a thousand years to get across the, uh, the galaxy. And then to go from our galaxy to the next galaxy might be millions or billions of years. You know, we can, we can see that far. But um, anyhow, the, this, is, this is all about light, right? And then, uh, so, um, and the speed of light is lower in materials than in vacuum. So uh, what changes about light is that when it, it's going through a medium that contains atoms and molecules, it interacts with those in an electrostatic way, in, a, in an elastic way that doesn't sap the um, energy from the electromagnetic field, but it, it compresses the wavelength. But this changes, uh, changes the wavelength, but not the frequency. Right. So, um, so, uh, the light travels more slowly, you know, but the number of um, peaks per second is the same because that determines the energy and the energy is conserved. The energy of light is conserved. The energy of a photon is conserved, right? And the particle description of light is that um, uh, the electromagnetic field can exchange energy with atoms, molecules, and things only in uh, packets of energy equal to H times mu, right? So um, uh, now Planck's constant is derived from uh, measurements of the wavelength of light and measurements of the energy of uh, a given wavelength of light, the vacuum energy of, uh, or the vacuum wavelength of light, right? So, um, uh, so the uh, Planck's constant here is uh, 10 to the minus 34 joule second. So uh, it's per photon, it's a very small value, right? And a joule is, um, you know, it's a fraction of the amount of, it's like a fourth of the amount of energy that it takes to take a, a gram of water and raise it by a degree centigrade, right? So this is like 10 to the minus 34th of that, right? So it's, it's like, very small, but um, you know, photons are super abundant in the universe, and it's very possible. I mean, it's it's very possible to detect single photons, right? That's that's really the only thing that you can detect <laughs> is single photons. If you want to detect the heat that is a consequence of many photons, you can do that. But if you want to say, I am detecting photons, you always get a pulse, right? So um, uh, the properties of light here. Um, are just, you know, this is, this is the only equation you need to know. Uh, e equals H nu equals HC over lambda equals HC nu bar. Now in this last one, uh, nu bar is equal to one over lambda where lambda is measured in centimeters, right? And so this C is in uh, uh, three times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second, right? So this, just when you use it there, just note you have to use this guy, 2.998 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second, right? And otherwise, this is the only equation you need to know. Uh, for light, right? And, uh, uh, you know, light, it turns out, is um, an extremely friendly uh, thing for humans, right? Extremely fortuitous and amazing um, 
uh, sorry, got a little bit of noise out here. It's an amazing thing for humans. And because um, we, we see all the colors we see is just tiny sliver of the optical spectrum. And all the colors that we see in my yellow shirt and my orange shirt and, you know, reds and blues and greens, that's, that's only from a, um, uh, you know, maybe a, not even a twofold, I mean, the visible, really, it's, 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 I mean, violet to red, it's like 400 to 650, maybe a twofold increase in the uh, frequency of light or, or the wavelength of light, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and it's right in this narrow sliver in the middle of an enormous spectrum. And fortunately for us, there's this huge region of, of spectral space here that's, oh, I'm sorry, it's actually, it's not there, sorry. That's the, uh, that's the near infrared. The, um, the very quiet part of the spectrum here, there's a huge chunk of spectrum here where uh, the universe and, and Earth is very dark and very quiet, right? There's, there's, there is radiation of that frequency, but it's very low level. So we can create waves, electromagnetic waves in this frequency range. And there's so little background that we can just create these little chirps and they can be seen for miles and miles away, right? And that's how cell phones communicate. They create these little microwave frequency chirps. And then this um, cell tower that could be miles away can see all these, you know, thousands and thousands of cell phones that it services, and it can pick up the radiation from each one, right? And it can decode that radiation into, you know, many, many, many bits of information per second. And um, and so this is the this is sort of our communication window, right? And then uh, there's, it's also pretty quiet in the near infrared here. Uh, the ultraviolet um, uh, below, below about 200 is pretty quiet on Earth's surface because uh, molecules such as oxygen and nitrogen, carbon dioxide, they absorb this, uh, there's a, a region called the vacuum ultraviolet. And, um, and then x-rays and gamma rays, th those are actually fairly quiet too. And so uh, those x-rays and gamma rays are harder to produce. X-rays uh, are um, generated uh, normally by bombarding uh, targets with high energy electrons and uh, sometimes by um, accelerating electrons in rings like colliders. And then you can put the, when you accelerate the electron by changing its trajectory with the magnetic field, it puts off synchrotron radiation. There's similar effects like that. And you can get X-rays, right? Gamma rays are ultra high energy and they generally come from uh, nuclear processes. So um, anyhow, so what we learn uh, as chemists uh, from uh, these different uh, frequencies is we, and at the very low energy, we learn about, we can irradiate molecules. And if we can detect the radiation, uh, the, the source with and without the molecules, then we can see the rotational spectrum. And uh, the rotational spectrum contains the frequencies of rotation, right? We can also see the frequencies of vibration and the vibration is the uh, motions of the nuclei. Uh, hold on. 
<laughs> oh, God. Oh, man, I'm in trouble. I want to show you guys this text, but I can't do it. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so we can see the uh, rotation of the masses, the massive nuclei and molecules. We can look at the vibrations against the electrostatic forces set up in the covalent bonds or ionic bonds, actually, between atoms. We can look at the um, electronic states in the, in the visible and the ultraviolet. And then we can look at the, the bound electrons, the, the, say the, uh, the 1s and the 2s electrons from larger atom in the X-ray regime. So um, we have a lot to learn from molecules by the absorption of light, right? So um, absorption spectrophotometry is what we're going to focus on. And uh, going to measure chemical concentration a little bit, right? So um, the idea here is that um, molecules have different states, right? And the states of a molecule are um, um, the states of a molecule have to do with um, uh, the way that the electrons are configured around the nuclei, right? The electronic state could be um, uh, and the um, another thing that the molecule, another thing that contributes to the energy of a molecule is the motions of the nuclei, right? And they can be driven by light. The rotations, right? These are all things that electromagnetic radiation can interact with in a molecule. And so, um, if you think only about the energy available in that 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 a photon of light, a photon, which is this quantity of light that the electromagnetic field can interact with molecules. So then, then you say, well, there's always a one-to-one -one correlation between the energy of the electromagnetic field and the difference in the state energies of the molecule, right? So um, the easy example that uh, one likes to give is the hydrogen atom, right? And uh, Niels Bohr worked out this model where uh, the he can show that the radii, if he just said, okay, forget some of the other weird stuff about quantum mechanics, let's just assume that at electron is orbiting around a nucleus, like a planet orbits the sun or something, right? And if it, if it orbits and then uh, a hydrogen atom, an electron orbits a, a proton, right? There's, there's a lowest stable orbit, right? There's a minimum stable orbit and that's called the ground state, right? And then there's a higher state right here, right? And for hydrogen atoms, only the hydrogen atoms only absorb and emit. They do both in these discrete colors, right? And so there's an absorption and an emission at exactly the same wavelength. And that wavelength is between the ground state and the excited state. And uh, so that would be between n equals zero and n equals one. And then there's also an absorption and an emission between n equals zero and n equals two and zero and three, right? And the 
the actual energy is proportional to the difference in the quantum states squared. So you got one squared and two squared, which is four. So you got energy one, got energy four times that, energy nine times that, right? And so it's the idea that um, the state energy differences are reflected in the energies of the photons that interact with them that are either that either change the state of the molecule or which the molecule creates those photons when the molecule uh, changes state, right? So, um, uh, so that's kind of a cool thing, right? That's how molecules sort of interact with the environment or atom, atoms and molecules, right? And so in, in, in the diagrams that chemists like to uh, use, there's, um, there's always a line and drawn for the ground state, right? And sometimes there's levels above it, but let's ignore those right now just for simplicity, right? And absorption of light, so this is for light, absorption and light emission, right? There's, a, there's a, a straight upward arrow, right? And it always starts there and ends there. And it has to start and end right on the line, right? Otherwise there's, otherwise there's no interaction between the photon and the, and the atom or molecule. The photon just, it's like it's invisible, right? The photon just goes right on by, right? And then when, when so, when the molecule creates a photon, atom ion or molecule creates a photon, we, we show a straight arrow going down. And this, this creates um, a, uh, a photon of frequency nu, where h nu is e2 minus e1, right? Where this is uh, e2 up here, and this is e1. And if E1, if you if E1 is zero, let's say, then H nu will just be equal to E2, right? If you define E1 such that it's zero. So um, and the and so molecules can be large, and sometimes molecule has parts that absorb and other parts that don't. The entire molecule or the light absorbing part can be called a chromophore if that's the part that absorbs and or emits light, right? And um, so uh, these excited states, the ground state is, you know, reflects um, N equals zero for electronic, uh, V equals zero for vibrational, and J equals zero for rotational, right? And, and up here we have excited um, states of energy as well, right? So electronic vibrational rotation. All excited states, um, well, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> I thought I was gonna say something, okay. Anyway, that we're sort of, this is saying more what I just said, right? This is saying, that the uh, change in energy is equal to E2 minus E1 equals E equals H nu, right? So this connects the, the, the color and the element, right? Or the color and the, and the molecule. Okay, so... Um, We could we could do this. Um, we could think about uh, twenty three hundred wave number absorption of energy by CO two. So um, for CO two here, um, delta E equals H nu equals H C over lambda is equal to. <coughs> HC nu bar, right? So um, this, 
you just you just plug in those constants here and we can get the answers to this you know and you can do the same with o2 right uh, it's uh, this this one this form we would use for um, the uh, co2 and this form we'd use for uh, the o2 recall when you do o2 you're going to use uh, to do this one, you use H, which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. C is 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And lambda here is going to equal 147 times 10 to the minus ninth meters. So you have to uh, put in the minus nine there. And you'll get the right answer. And here you'll use um, uh, H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. C is equal to 3.00 times 10 to the 10th centimeters per second and a new bar will equal um, one over lambda in centimeters. So whatever new bar here, this is, uh, so it'll be, um, uh, the only difference here is you take C in three times 10 to the 10th and multiply it by new bar using this uh, wave number unit. So hopefully that can, uh, uh, and most of you have seen this a zillion times already. So, uh, but we're just going to revisit it real quickly here. Um, so here's an example of that, right? Um, there's H, there's C, there's Lambda, 147 times 10 to the minus ninth, right? And there's, uh, there's that. So, and then if you need to know this is joules per molecule, right? And if you need to know it in kilojoules per mole or kilojoules per mole, then you multiply by six times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole, right? And you'll get 814 times 10 to the third joules per mole or 814 uh, kilojoules per mole. Okay, so there's more, more examples of that here. And uh, oops, sorry, it has a wild scroll to it. I'm using OneNote now. So um, an absorption spectrophotometer here, a spectrometer, has a source, a light source, a monochromator or wavelength uh, dispersion device, a sample and a light detector, right? And sometimes um, the uh, uh, sample, sometimes this is over here, right? Um, uh, and that, that works very well in many cases because when you integrate the wavelength selector and detector, you just put the sample in front of the light source. So you can, as an alternative here, you can have the source Then you've got your sample here. Then you've got your monochromator and detector all integrated into one unit, right? And then, you know, you've got a PC out here or whatever. And uh, this, is, this is faster, but it's a little bit harder on the sample because the samples always getting all of the radiation, right? If it's, if you're radiating with ultraviolet, then your sample gets quote sunburn, right? So you can do some photochemistry with it there. But the way that our carry 50 units work is like this. And they do uh, one wavelength at a time. depending on the setting there. So um, uh, 
This is an excellent uh, graphic that shows how a grading, this is a transmission grading, right? And it shows um, a light beam incident from the left here. And it shows that beam breaking up into um, rainbows, right? And we see red, orange, yellow, green, indigo and violet here, right? Oh, I'm sorry, blue, indigo and violet. Right, Roy G. Viv, or Viv Gior, right? And the, um, And there's a zero order, <laughs> one here where just the light is just transmitted, right? And then at, for one wavelength, for a slip of one wavelength, right? A, a mismatch of one lambda, you get n equals one. And for n equals two, you can sort of see it down here a little bit. You can see the second order diffraction. And the second order diffraction is actually more spread out. But uh, in any case, that's how the um, monochromators work, right? And then what you would do is you, you set it up so that you can tilt the grating and you create a small slit through which the, the light can pass. And then you get only one, you get as nearly as possible only one wavelength at a time. <laughs> So um, then the, this, you know, the important part of us, uh, this uh, part of the operation is that you have light power P0 that's incident on the sample and light power P that's transmitted, right? So this is incident. And transmitted. Right? And if there's no reflections, which there's always reflections, but if you can neglect the reflections, then, um, and you can neglect scattering of the light beam, then the absorption of molecules in the sample reduces P0 to the value P. And if, if there's no absorbing component in the sample, then P is equal to P0, right? So this is the basis of light absorption spectrophotometry, right? Irradiance is in watts per meter uh, square meter. Um, and basically what we, we, we just simply refer to these as light power. And we always use it as a ratio. So the units always cancel. So um, you don't have to worry about that. And monochromatic is one color and our one wavelength. So it could all be blue or red or yellow or green or whatever. You know, those are what we perceive as monochromatic. And then the detector measures the light power P and P0. And normally it's some response that has been calibrated into, you know, some unit, but the units are always canceled by, um, by division anyway, so. So um, how is uh, light power and uh, concentration uh, related here? Well, um, you, you, the way you do this is you set the wavelength, you put in a blank, you measure the value P0, you put in a sample, you measure the value P, and then compute the absorbance here, which is the negative log, negative base 10 log of P over P zero, right? And um, then uh, A, the absorbance, is related to C, the concentration of the absorber by uh, Beer's law here, right? And there's, there's just one thing that weirded me about, out about this is the, the molar absorptivity has these strange units of 
reciprocal molar reciprocal centimeters, right? But there, um, but that's just the way it works. You know, it's because A is unitless. The log of that ratio is unitless. The, the ratio is unit, the log of the ratio is unitless. And so epsilon BC, you need to cancel the, um, the C value with inverse centimeters and can't, I'm sorry, cancel the B value with inverse centimeters and cancel the C value with inverse molar. So anyway, it's just a weird unit. So concentration is A over epsilon B. And yay. <laughs> I don't know what that means, what that's supposed to mean. Really. Um, so there are limits to the applicability of this. Um, this is called Beer's Law. And um, it's best if the irradiances are measured using monochromatic light, monochromatic light, right? And it can't be super intense. You know, it has to be, if you're actually bleaching the uh, absorbing species, then that doesn't work either, right? So it's rare that you would see that, but you know, it's, there's limits on how intense the light can be, right? And the concentration of the absorbing species or the path length have to be short enough to keep the absorbance below about two, right? So you could say that, well, maybe you wanna keep the uh, concentration below 0.1 molar and, and or the path length short. And so this is, this is all basically to keep the absorbance less than about uh, two. When the absorbance is larger than that, then the, um, for various reasons, the absorbance value becomes unreliable. In Beer's law, this relationship does not hold when A is greater than two or 2.5 maybe. So, and also, you know, um, you can't, like if you're doing a dilution series, you have to make sure that there's no equilibria that couple to the diluting species that will change its chemical state, you know? But, you know, you, you just have to be aware that, you know, chemicals being what they are can have different extinction coefficients. So um, also absorbances, right, they sum, right? So if you have more than one thing in your, in your solution that absorbs light, then you have to, uh, at any given wavelength, if you have species one with epsilon one and species two with epsilon two, at a particular wavelength, right? The, then you have to sum these guys up in order to calculate the absorbance, right? So normally what we're looking for is concentration, right? So we have a little bit of work to do to extract concentration from this. So Normally we'll need more than one uh, wavelength to do this, but it can definitely be done and we will do it. Okay, here's the basic equations and I think you guys know these by now. So um, I'm gonna skip the, these basic calculations here. Um, you guys can do them on your own and do them in the homework, that's fine. Uh, and we're gonna move on to a derivation of Beer's law, right? And the derivation of Beer's law is simply um, that um, if you have in your sample incident light and emergent and transmitted light here, right? The light power at any given point decreases by a value dp over a length dx, right? So, um, and that's just the, the basis of, we're starting to develop a little uh, differential equation here. So. And it's an easy one, so you'll like it, <laughs> I hope. So um, now uh, dp right here is here. And the idea is that dp will equal minus beta, some coefficient, right? That's related to the absorber times, times p, right? So dp will always be proportional to p. If, if you get a large amount of light coming in, it will drop by a larger amount, right? 
so that the, the amount absorbed will be a constant fraction of the total incident height, right? So we've got dp equals minus beta p times c, actually beta cp, right? Times dx, right? dx is the distance. So beta c dx is what you multiply dp by, by, uh, or what you multiply p by to get dp. So I like to think of it as dp is equal to p. That's a negative value because you're losing energy times beta c dx, right? The larger dx, the larger dp, right? And then this linear limit here, we're thinking about a little linear piece that um, is proportional to the power, proportional to an extinction coefficient, proportional to concentration. Okay. <clears throat> and all you got to do is divide out by P and integrate over P on the left side and X on the right side from zero to B. And you that's a log. And then Beer's law uses the base 10 log and beta becomes epsilon. And that's the familiar unit is, is, is epsilon, right? So this is all there is to Beer's law, right? And uh, so, um, uh, and uh, so Beer's law re uh, refers to the absorption of light Right, so um, if you have a spectrum here, oops, yeah, go back, go back. Ah, I made a boo boo. <laughs> uh oh, my entire presentation is gone. Lucky you guys. Okay, it's pretty much thrashing now, I think. Yeah. You know what? I bet you that you guys are all pretty much bored stiff. <clears throat> so let's have just a little Q&A, then we can wind up. So head Argo. Yes. Did, did any of this make sense? Yeah, I was following along with the notes with the PowerPoint. Good. It's just, I mean, it's more just like calculations really and conversions. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. It really is. It really is. <clears throat> Though, you know that, um, in the turn of the century, when the physicist uh, first discovered, you know, this was basically when the Bohr model was put forth, you know, that, you know, everybody was trying to figure out how light and electrons interacted by thinking about the frequency of vibration of electrons, you know. And it was Bohr who said, no, it, that's not right. It's only the difference in electron energies, right? And that was like, what in the hell, you know? That was like a huge revelation to everybody involved. So, um, uh, just the idea that the state energy differences could be dictating everything was just really wild. You know, it was just really wild for everybody involved. So, um, 
the the atomic world is conservative, right? So it it likes to conserve momentum and it likes to conserve energy. And and it does so, you know, through various routes, you know, uh, like um, through various trajectories, whatnot. Um, so if you have, a, so let me ask you this, Gerardo. Um, if you have a molecule in its ground state and it absorbs a photon of say one electron volt, one EV photon, right? And that's like, that's like, or maybe, I don't know, could, let's say it's five EV, let's say it's five EV, right? So that, that's a fairly significant photon, right? And this molecule is in the gas phase, right? So it's not interacting with anything else, right? But it's free to rotate and vibrate. Um, what what ways can that molecule store the energy that it derives from the photon? How can it how can it take all this energy from the electromagnetic field and suck it up? Um, I mean. So I understand that you're saying that this molecule itself is absor absorbing a great amount of energy. Mm -hmm. You're saying in the gaseous state. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I mean, it would have to do something within the molecule, but I'm not exactly too sure. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So one thing that molecules can do, <clears throat> because molecules are made of charges, right? Charges and masses, right. charge and mass. Mm -hmm. That's all there is, you know? And, 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 one thing you can do is you can separate the charges a little bit, right? And, and in a molecule or an atom, right? That separation is, there's really only certain distances you can separate it by. It could, it's like, you can't get it in the middle. It has to go, dun, has to go the full distance, right? Say from N equals zero to N equals one, clank, right? And let's say that was 4.5 EV, right? But you mm -hmm. notice you notice that this molecule now, this molecule absorbed all five, right? So it's got a, there's another half an EV that's not accounted for, right? Then where else besides this electronic energy can that molecule store the energy from the electromagnetic field? And it's, it's a kind of a trick question here, right? Because I just said it about five minutes ago or two minutes ago or something. And I said that the molecule can store energy in electronic states and what other states? Electronic? Oh my God. Uh, electronic and physical. No, no, not physical. Um, John, I, I can't think of it. I honestly can't think of it. Somebody help him out. Translational. Oh, so close. Vibrational. Yes, vibrational. Vibrational. Right, yeah, right, 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 right. Exactly. And vibrational states are they? Can they have any energy, or are they limited by quanta also? Mm -hmm. Limited? They are limited to quanta. If only certain values are allowed. Right, sings it. Right. Now, how about rotational energy? Is it free to take on any value that it wants, or is it also limited? Yes, Snigda, it is all by rotations are also limited, right? So that 5.4 or that five electron volts is a combination of four and a half volts and electronic potential you know, probably 0.4 volts of vibrational energy and 0.1 volts of rotational energy, right? And those are the only ways, unless you count magnetic separately from electric, which I don't, those are the only ways that electronic, that molecules can interact with light, right? 
as far as I know, yes. And and so the 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 sum of all those energies is a potential energy, right? Now, um, you might say that you might say, oh, vibrational is alternating kinetic and potential energy, right? Because like when it's it's like stretching them the the atoms are racing away, they have kinetic energy, then they get to their extremes, they stop, it's all potential, and then they snap back, it's kinetic and then potential, and kinetic and potential, it's alternating back and forth, right? That is, that, so you can argue whether or not that's kinetic or potential energy, right? If it's just a vibrational state, and you don't think about the atoms moving, maybe you can say it's all potential, right? And then the rotational energy, you could say, well, that's all kinetic, man, but it's a state. So you could say, well, that's potential, right? So I'm not exactly sure how that shakes out. But the, um, the total energy, right, um, that an atom in the gas phase can have is like, um, uh, it's these multiples of R, right? There's uh, three halves are for translation, right? But that has nothing to do with interaction with light, right? And then there's um, uh, and then there's vibration, which is what in two dimensions? Stop it, snake dust. You're getting ahead of me. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, let me pull this train back on track here. <laughs> I'm getting a little bit out of my area here. And um, uh, so now <clears throat> that's in the gas phase, right? We got uh, the ways that electromagnetic energy can exchange, uh, can, can give up its energy to a molecule is from electrical potential, vibrational, and rotational energies. And that's the only, only three ways, right? And uh, <clears throat> um, so when, um, uh, when a molecule then is, now imagine a molecule, like it could be just a hydrogen atom, right? or hydrogen molecule rather, these two atoms and it can rotate and vibrate, right? And now you've got it in, in solution, let's say, could be in water or hexane or anything, right? But just focus on the, focusing on the molecule for a moment and then everything else is a solvating environment, right? Then how many times do you think it can rotate before it sort of bumps into something and reverses or bumps and stops or, you know, gives away its rotational energy. Anybody want to take a shot at that? How many times a hydrogen molecule could rotate? Well, they rotate, you know, several billion times per second and they cannot get through a rotation without, without being involved in a collision. Right. So <clears throat> what happens is that what used to be a very narrow rotational line for the gas phase gets spread way out. Right. And that's because of interactions with the environment. That it could be hindered or it could be helped or whatever by collisions with other things. And so the exact interactions that that rotation has with light become broadened, right? And that's just one molecule, right? And you take all the sum of all molecules and all their broadenings, and you get even further broadening, right? And that's just one rotation, right? Now you think of a rotation and a vibration. How many vibrational mo times can a mo molecule vibrate be before it bumps into something? I don't know, maybe 10 or who knows, something like that. But the environment will also broaden the vibrational bands. 
right? So when you do spectroscopy in physical chem lab, you generally only use gas phase, right? Because gas phase, you can get through the electronic vibrational and <clears throat> rotational spectra without, with the molecules not interacting with their environment at all, right? But once you put them in solution, then um, uh, let me, well, I've got you, I've got three more minutes to torment you guys. Um, who can answer me uh, why, um, why would um, uh, take a simple molecule like um, HCl and before it ionizes, just a molecule HCl and it's in water. It's dissolved in water. Before it's broken up, it's dissolved in water. What sorts of interactions will this molecule be having with the water? What, how, what sort of energetic interactions will it have with the water? I want to say there's some hydrogen bonding between the water molecules and the HCl. Yes, exactly right. There is, there's, there's hydrogen bonding, exactly. There's hydrogen bonding and there's polar interactions generally, right? And there's also some repulsive and some attractive, some sort of generic sort of repulsive and, and attractive interactions through van der Waals mechanisms other things like that, right? And um, uh, so, um, gosh, I forgot what I was going to ask there. Um, talking basically about broadening how how when we do the spectroscopy of something in the condensed phase everything's really broadened and um, I think I'm just sort of making the same point with HCl right because um, when it's in water the there'll be hydrogen bonds <laughs> and uh, it will um, It'll be, it'll be interacting with the water and it just cannot, it's, <clears throat> what will happen is that, um, oh, the lines will be broadened. I am not quite sure how to put that. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, well, it's okay. Just remember that lines are broadened in condensed phase, right? So what was a line in, in the gas phase will become a big a big patch in the in the in the condensed phase. Condensed phase is anything in liquid or solid form, right? And condensed phase includes solvent plus solute or just pure, you know, liquid, whatever, you know, a neat, a neat um, molecule molecular uh, liquid or something like that. Okay, guys, thank you very much for listening. Um, there is a uh, homework due this Friday, and it's 18A. So uh, don't forget that. And um, uh, I've been through the problems. They're not too hard. If you have any trouble with one, yeah, 18A. Isn't it? Or is that, or is... Oh, no, no, no. It's chapter five that's due this Friday, five. right? Five is due this Friday, right. Five is due this Friday. Sorry. Homework five. Oh, gosh. Okay. And 18A is next Friday. Okay, cool. Okay. All right. I've said enough. I'm just getting myself in trouble here. Any, any more questions?
I'll see every I'll see you uh, Thursday people tomorrow morning at nine, and we're gonna uh, do further HPLC adventures. Okay, guys. Bye bye. Thank you, bye, Professor. Bye. <laughs> Jeffrey, go away.